find a video online uh, that is completely deranged than they are to be approached by somebody asking them again to join a union, right? Or to be cut, right? A, some sort of situation where we'll get a different form of political and civic education. Uh, you know, and so these are all problems that are, have to be resolved together. It's really complex. You know, we have to address people's economic circumstances along with the fact that they're isolated, along with problems of the media, along with problems of our political system. Uh, so there's a lot on our plates <laughs> as as um, as potential organizers. But, you know, there's no other way. You know, there's no shortcuts. Right. I mean, and it's just uh, it, a sense of belonging, I think, is is integral. To- yeah. And, and agency. Um, yeah, on the sense of belonging, I think it's really interesting because that's one thing the right wing does, right? It, it provides people a sense of group um, identity and you know vict- collective victimization, whereas neoliberal Democrats have a- appealed to people as individuals, right? As sort of individual rational actors who are pursuing a tax cut <laughs> or a, a tax credit instead of, you know, uh, building a group solidarity and encouraging people to, again, conspire, to breathe together, to see themselves as interconnected. Yeah, really well said. And I, I mean, I, I think a lot of this, a lot of this was, uh, I think, integral to Occupy Wall Street in terms of a moment where the left said, OK, we're going to have agency and we're going to take uh, this situation into our own hands. And you write about that in your book, your experience, your experiences with uh, Occupy Wall Street, the sense of um, we're all in this together and we're going to reject this neoliberal hegemony of atomization and corporatism, et cetera. Um, It's in your chapter entitled Failing Better. So I take it that you see Occupy Wall Street in in many ways as a failure, but in in other ways as a really important lesson. So if you could just talk about your experiences there, uh, which you do write about. Yeah, almost a decade. It's almost the 10 year anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. I mean, you know, Occupy was the left's response to the financial crisis. And I think we have to remember that the financial crisis uh, spawned its own right-wing conspiracies, right? So what was deeply troubling about that period is not only were we witnessing what was at that point the greatest financial disaster since the Great Depression, but that it was the right wing that was mobilizing. The Tea Party was incredibly active on the ground as much as they were a Koch brother spawned invention and supported by you know, right wing billionaires. They also mobilized something like half a million people across the country to protest on tax day. I believe it was 2009. And it, it absolutely broke my heart that conservatives were seizing the moment and blaming the financial crisis on black mortgage holders <laughs> because it was a racist, you know, that was their their racist um, explanation instead of looking at the uh, economic system, again, naming capitalism, naming political corruption uh, as the problem and demanding justice in the form of bankers going to jail, which of course didn't happen. So Occupy Wall Street, you know, I was very happy that people were mobilizing around the financial crisis. And in the, the chant was absolutely right. Banks got bailed out, we got sold out. Uh, and, you know, I guess for me, I knew that Occupy couldn't last. You can't camp forever. And also that's not, you know, a literal lever of power, right? I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's like, oh, so what? What if the encampment had lasted this last 10 years? I mean, what would that accomplish? You have to, uh, what I saw was that what it, it provided a kind of context where we could, uh, where people, and by we, I mean people who wanted to respond to that moment could find each other and strategize ways forward, right? And I think it's, in retrospect, it was a real breakthrough because it Occupy did put class back at the center of the American conversation. Uh, it The frame of the 99% and the 1% was incredibly powerful. People started talking about inequality, started talking about capitalism, I directly led to the success of the uh, Sanders campaign, not as much success as I would have liked to see, but nevertheless, something that would have been unimaginable a few years before, paved the way for the growth of Democratic Socialists of America, you know, and their and, and for the squad. So it really changed um, the American political landscape in critical ways. 
So, you know, my attitude toward organizing is that it's always an experiment and you never get the whole thing. So net organizing is never a success. It's always a sort of failure. And that's why the idea of failing better is a really wonderful idea. And what I tried to say in that essay is that, you know, what you have to do, it, it's easy to sit on the sidelines and say what people should do or what propose, you know, what proposals should be enacted. The challenge is figuring out how you get from A to B. You know, and it's really a humbling thing to organize. It's way easier to write essays or to make films, which are the other things I do. Organizing requires, again, conspiring, convincing others to join with you, finding common ground, uh, being a good comrade, and then being like, what do we actually do to begin to build the power to enact the policies and proposals and radical transformations we want to see? It's really, uh, it's really hard work. And you do have to become acquainted with failure. You don't know. Where, when you're going to find success. Um, and, you know, and so Occupy led for me to joining with others to form the debt collective. We're deep in the fight for the cancellation of student debt uh, and, you know, wanting to build an even broader movement that attacks other issues. But um, uh, yeah, we keep um, failing and failing better. I think it's a decent motto. It might not be the most rousing, but for me, it's realistic. Well, uh, yeah. And it's the eternal struggle of, of, of leftism. Uh <laughs> And I, I actually wanted to ask you about what lessons you really did glean from Occupy that you brought to the Debt Collective, because loyal listeners of the show or watchers will know that Astra's been on a few times to talk about student debt and the mounting crisis there. And you've been on here with other debt strikers who are not paying their student debt. Biden has yet to cancel one dollar of it. I mean, how did you take some of those lessons to your work with the Debt Collective? Yeah, I mean, the big lesson for me of Occupy Wall Street was that it was a movement of debtors. That's not how it was advertised, you know, but that was the reality of people's lives and uh, and part of what drew them, even if it wasn't explicit, right? So once I was there amongst the people, it became clear that we were all buried in debt. We felt that we'd never be able to own homes. We'd never be able to save for retirement because we're busy trying to dig ourselves out of medical debt, student debt, credit card debt. And that debt is a consequence of the fact that wages have stagnated. So since the 1970s, you know, we've seen the rewards go to the top, to the proverbial 1%. And regular people have had to compensate with credit. So that means essentially that you're underpaid at the job and then you're robbed, <laughs> uh, you know, because you're charged fees and interest. Uh, and so that, that was a major lesson. Um, I think also, you know, a thing uh, I wanted then in the wake of Occupy to be part of a movement that was more disciplined, right? You know, where we had demands and we had kind of formal structures of engagement. And that is important. But I think you also need that magic. You need that kind of chaos in the opening uh, that uh, uh, an event like Occupy allows where, you know, people can just come and be part of something. And so for me, I think another lesson of Occupy that I'm kind of coming to grips with is that you need, you also need that mess, right? You need to um, you need to be a bit forgiving. You know, a movement is not, um, you know, I like to say that a movement is not like a pizza that you order up with all of your favorite toppings and it's just so. I mean, they're always going to be, they're always going to be a bit frustrating and not exactly what you want. You can't wait around for the perfect movement, right? You really have to have to take advantage of them when those openings um, come about, you know? And so, yeah, I would, as I've written, I think, uh, maybe not in this book, but elsewhere, you know, I wasn't a fan of the constant drum circle. <laughs> that wouldn't be part of my ideal movement. But, um, but you know, I sucked it up and, and did my best to take the potential of that moment and turn it into something lasting. And tons of other people did too. And that's what we just need to keep doing and keep doing and keep doing. Yeah. I mean, I, I still, I remember the critique of Occupy at the time was, well, we, we understand they're upset, but what is the goal, right? Yeah. And, like, it's just such a fundamental misunderstanding of the messiness of activism, as you as you say. Um, throughout history, there have been n unclear goals in activism that has pushed uh, the conversation in a different way, that have fought for, for rights for people, um, different factions asking for different things, infighting between factions. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about the civil rights movement, and that's completely whitewashed in people's minds. People always think that the present day uh, leftist push that they're seeing is, 
not analogous to the very whitewashed uh, civil rights movement that we've been taught. Oh, th there's one way to do this correctly, even though, of course, we know that back then there was many gradations. But I digress. Um, I actually want to talk about what you wrote about, about activism, uh, particularly how activism as a concept gained traction in the, in the 1960s. So I think that's a smooth transition to that. that. I think what you said is really important. I do want to say that, you know, part of why I think I was ready to throw myself into the Occupy Wall Street movement when it started is that I had read a lot of history of the civil rights era and the 60s. And, and one lesson I learned from that reading was that it was a total mess, right? And that this idea that, you know, uh, there was perfect discipline and perfect leadership in the past that we don't measure up to is, is you know, uh, not a standard we should hold ourselves to, right? People have always had to experiment and never, and, you know, felt really hopeless through lots of their campaigning. Um, I think, so there's an essay called Against Activism. Uh, and I, one thing, I wrote it quite a few years ago, and I think it's also a, a, a bit less timely than it was when I wrote it. And that's a good thing. So, um, the piece argues that there's a difference between activism and organizing. And you can be, you know, the basic observation is that you can be an activist on your own, right? You can say, I'm an activist for the environment or an activist for animal rights or an activist for X, Y, or Z. And what you do is you sort of sound the alarm. Maybe you tweet a lot. Uh, maybe you just, you know, you sort of uh, proselytize for your cause. You can't organize alone, Right. That's the thing. It, again, is bringing people together, trying to get people to act in concert in unison. Organizing is a collective act. And that's when you try to, to build a social block that can wield political power. And I felt, you know, uh, through the aughts um, yeah, and definitely to occupy that there was a, a lack of attention to the art of organizing and that people were stuck in the frame of activism. Um, and that it had to do with the um, decline of labor organizing, the decline of uh, a certain type of organizing that was prominent um, within uh, workers' movements and also in the in the sort of classic civil rights era, um, and that we had moved as a society into a more kind of activist mindset. I think now, though, um, a lot of young younger people, you know, people of the next generation, are re revitalizing the art of organizing. And that's something that I take a lot of, um, I take a lot of encouragement from. I think people, they're reading folks like Jane McAlevey, the great union organizer, they're going back and reading their history. And they're realizing that, you know, we have to actually build a mass base, um, that we can't leave social change to politicians, to sort of professional NGOs, um, or to just random individuals, you know, who might mean well. Uh, and so that is something I, I think there has been real growth um, post Occupy Wall Street, actually, uh, and that the, the resurgence of, of organizing is part of that. Um, but at the time when I wrote it, I felt that there was a real there, there was a real lack of attention to this. And it is hard. You know, I think for me, the art of organizing is something I really struggled to learn. You know, where do you go to learn this, these techniques <laughs> and something that you really learn by doing? And so there's a feeling, you know, for, for me that there's kind of reinventing the wheel, trying to figure out how to do this thing that I think it, we all need to be able to do if we're going to have a democracy. Yeah. And, and I mean, it brings it back to our discussion about atomization and isolation, which is I, 2020 was yeah. the most isolated year that you know we've we've experienced in terms of just the, the everyone having to quarantine etc and i think that punctuated a lot of the dynamics that you're talking about here um and so I, I i'll bring it back to where we started as as we wrap up the interview um how did that increased atomization and isolation highlight a lot of um, the importance of organizing. And how do you combat that in a world where everything is so individualized and I sound like a boomer, but everyone's on their tech and it's very easy to feel superficially connected without actually having meaning. And it's almost like a sugar high of connectivity. And then you go and you're actually very much isolated and alone how do you how do you combat those trends that were so stark last year 
Yeah, it's a really, I mean, it's a tough question. I wish I had all of the answers. I do think that we have to, you know, using technology in um, disciplined, strategic ways. 